Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I enjoyed the uh, introduction of the bill, and particularly uh, the proponents' comments that uh, we are here to seek truth and light on the proposed resolution before us. And um, my intent is to ask some questions to get exactly that, truth and light, about what we're voting on. Uh, so I guess I would start with the title. The title of the resolution before us says, uh, the resolution declaring the continuation of the public health and civil preparedness emergencies in the state. And um, just for clarification's sake, uh, through you, Madam President, are we uh, in effect continuing the existing public health and civil preparedness emergencies that expire February 15th? Through you, Madam President. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam President. That's actually uh, an excellent question, and I want to make sure that I uh, get into the, the meat of that, because while uh, the emergencies uh, themselves are, are certainly continuing, no one is re pretending that the COVID pandemic began uh, today, uh, the uh, previous emergency declarations were made pursuant to statutory authority, uh, whereas this resolution uh, is being, pers uh, is being uh, adopted pursuant to our inherent constitutional authority. Uh, and there's some really major legal distinctions there, uh, but, uh, but certainly the emergency, uh, as, as you know, uh, began in March of 2020, uh, if not uh, at least uh, legally uh, in Connecticut. Through you. Senator Sampson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President, and I thank the gentleman for that answer. That was my expectation. Um, I would have preferred that we t entitle this resolution something different because it's uh, confusing the public to some degree because people keep saying to me that we're continuing the governor's emergency powers or we're continuing the existing uh, emergency states of emergency, uh, and in fact, we are not. Uh, so I appreciate that answer. Um, and just to clarify, I know you mentioned this in your opening remarks, um, uh, Senator, but th uh, through um, uh, the uh, um, Madam President, does this resolution that declares an extension to both the public health emergency and the civil preparedness emergency need to pass in order to ratify the bill that we just voted on, House Bill 5047, I believe it was? Senator, through you, Madam President. Senator Lesser. Uh, through you, Madam President, absolutely not. Senator Sampson. Thank you. And I know that this was mentioned in the House debate on Thursday. Um, and you just said it uh, a moment ago, um, and forgive me, the, the, the gentleman said it a moment ago, I don't want to address him directly, that would be inappropriate in the chamber. Um, it was stated that the governor is not being granted one additional amount of authority by virtue of this resolution. Is that correct through you, Madam President? Uh, through you, Madam President, uh, that is correct, and I would just note that because this is a, a House joint resolution, and Madam President, you uh, uh, have been a champion of civics education throughout your, your uh, public life, so I, I, I apologize for uh, explaining this to you, uh, but as you know, uh, resolutions don't even go to the governor's desk. Uh, it's just simply adopted by the uh, House and the Senate, uh, and it is a statement uh, of our uh, policies uh, under our powers by the, by the state legislature. There is no role whatsoever for the governor. Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. And I appreciate that answer, although I have to say that it's kind of puzzling to me because clearly the previous extensions that we made to the governor's public health emergency and civil preparedness emergency were designed for the expressed purpose of keeping the governor's power in force. And isn't it the point? of having the governor have his additional authority under the public health emergency and civil preparedness emergency that gives him the tools, as I've heard them described, to act swiftly in the case of emergency. Through you, Madam President. Senator Lesser. Uh, yes, Madam President, I, I would agree that the uh, governor's powers uh, under both the civil uh, preparedness uh, emergency statute uh, and the public health emergency statute uh, are important uh, tools for the governor to respond to any emergency. The, certainly the, those statutes uh, remain, they exist, uh, and the governor will be able to use them to respond uh, to future uh, emergencies. What we're saying uh, in the legislature uh, it, today uh, is that we are declaring an emergency uh, 
for uh, the purposes of COVID-19 uh, exists. And we are simply uh, recognizing uh, this is an existing uh, emergency for some of the reasons that I outlined in my opening remarks. Through you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. I appreciate that answer. Um, so we heard over and over during the last two extensions, um, and in fact, the governor asked the majority to extend those extensions and to renew his powers for the purpose of giving him those tools that we just talked about. It was said that that had to be done, and I, can, I think I'm quoting uh, both uh, um, the um, uh, majority leaders of, of both chambers to say that we need this so the governor can react immediately. That was the purpose of giving him those powers rather than leaving it up to us so he didn't have to wait around for the legislature to come along and pass legislation. We had to give the governor that power. That's what I remember hearing. And I remember also hearing that, well, you make a lot of good points, Senator Sampson, in your speeches about whether or not we're actually in a state of emergency, but forget that, because what's really important is that we're giving the governor this power so that even if there's not an emergency right this second, he will be able to react because he has this power in place in case of what might happen. And I'm sure I didn't have the time to go back and look at the legislative record, but that was the common phraseology from the last debate that we had in this chamber. So I'm confused. If the governor is no longer concerned about having those tools to act swiftly, and presumably he's being advised by experts, then why are we, or rather why are you um, concerned about that through you, Madam President? Well, uh, Madam President, it's a good question, uh, but I would just say that we're now entering the third year uh, of the pandemic. And although there's a lot we still don't know uh, about COVID-19 and about how it's changing and about how it's uh, affecting uh, people all across the state, there's a lot we do know. There's a lot we've learned. There's a lot we've put into place. Uh, right now, the vast majority of people in the state are vaccinated uh, against COVID-19. We are in a much better spot uh, in response to the pandemic than we were at the outset. Uh, and so uh, my hope uh, is that uh, those extraordinary powers granted to the governor uh, are no longer necessary. That's why uh, we were able to drill down on just a few key, uh, 12 key, uh, in fact, uh, provisions that we needed to uh, consider just a moment ago when we uh, enacted them uh, into law. Uh, and uh, we do need, uh, though, to uh, recognize that the emergency is still uh, ongoing for, for a number of purposes, including uh, for accessing uh, much needed uh, federal support. So, uh, look, I don't want to say that I know exactly what's coming down the pike, but I feel like uh, our state agencies, uh, our hospitals, our nursing homes uh, are much, much better prepared now in the spring uh, of 2022 or the uh, winter, hopefully spring, I'll, I'll have to look for a groundhog, uh, than, uh, uh, than we were uh, a couple years ago. And so uh, my hope is that those powers are no longer necessary. Uh, through you. Thank you, Senator Lesser, Senator Sampson. Well, thank you, Madam President. And I appreciate that answer, but I got to tell you, I'm even more confused now because the opening discussion was all about how the 12 or 13, I don't know how many we want to count, that, uh, items that were carried over that used to be the governor's executive orders that we just passed in House Bill 5047 were entirely separate from this. That, that has absolutely nothing to do with what we're doing right now. So I don't know why we would refer to that during this reference when I'm trying to figure out exactly what the legislature gains by passing these, uh, re this resolution declaring emergencies ourselves. Um, the good senator just said that there are a number of purposes why we need to do this. I'd like to know what those purposes are. Through you, Madam President. Senator Lesser. Well, Madam President, I would uh, highlight two. Uh, the first is authorized by the Federal uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act of 2020, uh, which, uh, under which the USDA Food and Nutrition Services has granted waivers to states, including to Connecticut, uh, allowing for issuance of emergency allotments uh, 
to uh, expand uh, SNAP benefits. Uh, and we just heard Senator Anwar discuss this uh, a few minutes ago, uh, but it's resulted uh, in just in, in the month of January uh, in $32.6 million of additional funding. Uh, if this were not to be carried in or we were to lose uh, that waiver, we would either have to supplant that by raiding uh, the state's rainy day funds, uh, by raising taxes, uh, or by uh, cutting uh, SNAP benefits to uh, people uh, altogether, uh, the, 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 the additional funding. Um, and as you know, uh, Senator, uh, or as Madam President, you know, uh, I'm trying to, again, obey, obey protocol. Um, as Madam President, you know, um, through you, uh, there have been uh, major hardships that go way beyond the pandemic itself. Because yes, there's the pandemic, uh, but there's also ancillary uh, economic and supply chain issues uh, that are hurting families, seeing higher prices uh, in uh, grocery stores, uh, and making sure that people get access to adequate nutrition at a particularly difficult time uh, is very important. Now, the other uh, one I would like to highlight, because uh, you asked, is uh, the uh, Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act, uh, which has provided additional FEMA resources uh, to Connecticut uh, to help uh, decongest congregate housing, uh, which is really important to keep a vulnerable communities safe. Through you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator. Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President, and I thank the gentleman for that lengthy answer, which really boils down the purposes to getting federal aid. That is the purposes, plural. Let's get federal aid. I'm wondering if there is any other purpose that the gentleman could point to that has something to do with us. Like, can we now do faster and better things to keep the people of Connecticut safe because we've declared a public health emergency, like the governor declared a public health emergency so he would have the tools to make executive orders so that he could do no-bid contracts and, and, and make things happen immediately? Are we doing that here through you, Madam President? Are we making Connecticut more responsive and faster and better to keep people safe with this bill? Through you, Madam President. Yes, thank you, Madam President. And I would say this is a resolution and not a bill, and that's a, perhaps a pedantic point, but it's also, I think, an important point, because what this is is a unilateral assertion by the legislature that we have a role to play here. You know, I heard much discussion uh, about the constitutional question, uh, about whether or not we were making a mistake uh, by ceding our power to the governor to handle a pandemic. And there was, the, the question was what, uh, in an emergency is the, is the power, the role of a legislature, and what is the role and power of a governor? Uh, and there's no easy answer to that. Certainly, uh, uh, an executive uh, has uh, the ability to move quickly, the ability to make decisions, uh, but there's clearly a role for the legislature. Uh, and in declaring uh, that this ongoing emergency that we're experiencing, uh, but by declaring it under our Article Three powers, I think what we're doing is making an important constitutional statement uh, that we are uh, a separate and co-equal branch of government, uh, that uh, we agree uh, with the governor uh, and with uh, the uh, previous acts of this legislature that there is in fact an emergency, but we are stepping up and saying that that authority that, uh, vests uh, with us. Um, and I would just say that this is a continuing sort of push-pull that we've seen throughout uh, the pandemic. You know, I think that if you look at the public health emergency statute, for example, uh, it does have significant checks and balances uh, by the legislature, but the civil preparedness emergency statute does not. Uh, and I think going forward, I think we're going to see continued efforts by this body uh, to make sure that we have appropriate checks and balances. Uh, and by passing a resolution as opposed to uh, a bill today, uh, I think we're making a step in that direction. So that's a, that's a more sort of nebulous constitutional point uh, through you, Madam President, but I think it's an important one. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. That's a lot to unpack. I asked a basic question, what benefit beyond obtaining federal money does this uh, create for the citizens of Connecticut? Um, first, I don't necessarily think that it agrees with the governor, since the governor has declined to continue his own declarations of emergency, so he's instead asked us to do so. So I'm not on the same page with suggesting that the governor seems to think the emergency is ongoing. He clearly doesn't, otherwise he would have declared an extension to his emergency. And the answer that I got from what is beyond passing this benefit to the citizens of Connecticut, other than just getting the federal money that was discussed, was a role to play, a constitutional statement, 
uh, a stand, although a nebulous constitutional point. I want to know how any of those things translate into improving the situation for the citizens of Connecticut, whether there is an emergency or not. Through you, Madam President. Senator Lesser. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you uh, to the good senator for asking that clarifying question. All of Connecticut residents benefit when we have strong, co-equal branches of government. And this resolution today reestablishes the legislative branch of government as a strong, co-equal, uh, independent branch uh, that serves as a check on the executive uh, and I suppose on the judiciary as well. And that's what we are doing in asserting our inherent constitutional powers. So how does that put five cents into the pocket of somebody trying to pay for groceries in uh, Wolcott or Middletown? That's a, obviously a harder case to make. And, and if that's your question, I would refer you to the federal funds that this brings in. But we all benefit from having a vibrant, strong democracy. Uh, and I think this bill gets us there. Resolution, forgive me. Senator Sansom. Thank you, Madam President. I appreciate that answer. Um, maybe I can ask this, this in an entirely different way. What is the federal government requiring from us in order to get that federal money? Through you, Madam President. Senator Lesser. Well, it's slightly different through you, Madam President, under each of the statutes, uh, but there is a requirement that the states uh, affected uh, be facing an emergency. And so in declaring, uh, recognizing uh, this ongoing emergency, uh, we believe, and the guidance that uh, I believe the state has received suggests uh, the federal government also believes, uh, is that we will uh, likely comply uh, with the terms of the two statutes at issue. And again, it's the Stafford Act uh, and the Family uh, First, uh, the, fam the Family First Corona Corona Coronavirus Response Act of 2020. Thank you, Madam President. I appreciate that answer. It seems to me um, that the answer is we must pass this resolution stating that there is an emergency. Uh, the good gentleman mentioned that we must be in an emergency, but is that actually a requirement? Or is it simply that we state that there is an emergency in this resolution to satisfy the request for federal funds? Through you, Madam President. You know, I'm not an expert on federal funding decisions, but again, my understanding is that the, both the text of the Stafford Act and the uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act require a declaration of a disaster. Now, it has to be also based on an actual disaster. A state just can't declare a disaster if there is, in fact, no disaster. Uh, but in fact, th in this case, there is a disaster, and we are recognizing it as such. Three of you. Thank you, Madam President. Okay, so I won't pin you down to uh, show me the exact document from the federal government asking for um, the verification that we are in an emergency, uh, but it is my impression um, after reviewing uh, those two federal programs that simply they're just asking for us to state that there's an emergency. They were satisfied when the governor stated we were in an emergency. Now that the governor is not stating that we are in an emergency and the legislature plans to do so via this resolution, that will be satisfactory for them to give up the federal grant money to the state. I don't think there's anything in there that says we must actually be in an emergency. And to me, that's the largest point that needs to be debated today. Um, because are we in an emergency? That is the real question before this chamber today. We heard from the outset, and actually no, I think it was the uh, closing argument of the previous bill, um, it was said more than once, we believe that we are in a state of emergency. And during the House debate, I heard uh, very clearly stated that there is a feeling that we are in an emergency. Forgive me, Madam President, but that is not good enough for me. What is good enough for me is some actual concrete thing that I can point to and say, that right there, that's an emergency. And that's why we need to have a resolution that says we have one. I've been making the case for quite a while now that we are no longer in a state of emergency. 
And one thing I want to do very quickly is I want to make sure that nobody thinks that I am conflating the notion that COVID-19 doesn't exist or is not real or is not affecting people and people are not dying from it with me saying there's no emergency. Those are two different things because COVID-19 isn't very, very real. 10,000 people in this state have died, many, many more the world over. The question, though, is, is the state in a state of emergency as a result? And I don't think it is. And I think I've done a good job of proving that it certainly isn't. And I'm going to make a, a, a more brief attempt at that in a moment. But I want to remind people what an emergency is. If you look it up in Merriam-Webster, it says an emergency is an unforeseen combination of circumstances or resulting state that calls for immediate action. Well, we've had this ongoing two-year series of policies, none of them responding to a specific unforeseen event, and nothing requiring immediate action, at least not in a long time. Certainly at the very outset of the pandemic, when everyone was in fear of the unknown, and the President of the United States came before the country and said, there is a terrible virus and we have no idea how deadly it can be. That was an emergency. But it is almost two years later. And there are vaccines, there are treatments, there are protocols. We have documentary evidence of what works and what doesn't. And we also know the degree to which it is affecting and impacting our society based on the number of people that are hospitalized and um, the number of people who sadly pass away as a result. And I submit that th those things do not add up to something that could be described as an emergency. It might be an emergency for the people directly involved, but an emergency for the state of Connecticut is an entirely different thing. Let me ask this question, and some of these are easy, but they'll get harder. Through you, Madam President, when did this emergency begin? Yes. Thank, thank you, Madam President. Uh, and, I, and I will answer that in just one second uh, in, with some precision. But I just want to briefly speak to whether or not we're in an emergency. We just, Madam President, passed emergency legislation. As I mentioned earlier, this resolution and that legislation are not directly tied. But we just waived our state's bidding laws. We just allowed out-of-state doctors uh, to, uh, and health care providers to practice in Connecticut. We just waived our state's insurance laws. We just allowed uh, waived uh, education laws. We waived Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection laws. We just went through 12 different areas of state law uh, at some length this afternoon, recognizing that there is an ongoing situation that needs to be addressed. And we wouldn't have done that uh, for temporary periods of time, whether it's in some cases um, February uh, 28th, in other cases March 15th, in other cases April 15th, and in other cases June 30th. We wouldn't have done that were we not in an emergency. Now, when did the emergency begin? The governor first declared uh, an emergency, I believe, on March 10th, 2020. Through you. Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. And I appreciate the response, although the reference to emergency certification, I think, is something that I would not lean uh, or put my, hang my hat on very hard. Because if I asked the gentleman to name one example of a specific emergency for every bill that we've emergency certified, well, just as long as I've been here, I think that would be a hard thing to do. I think everyone in this chamber knows very well we emergency certify bills without emergencies on a regular basis. And just because some legislation passed this chamber a few moments ago that could be described as in response to an emergency by some, it was not described that way by all. That bill passed on a partisan vote. I'm going to make this point in a larger way later, but I would point out that if there was a real emergency, it wouldn't be a partisan vote. So if the emergency began early on in 2020, a better question might be, when does it end? Through you, Madam President. Senator Lesser. Uh, through you, Madam President, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, what I do know is that this emergency declaration uh, ends on June 30th, 2022. Through you. Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. Does that imply that the emergency will end on June 30, 2022? Senator Lesser. Uh, Madam President, it is not. So I don't know um, 
what the gentleman meant when he said he was not sure when the emergency will end. So let me ask that a different way. How will anyone know? How will I know? If so you had to describe to me, Rob, we're in an emergency now because X. And when X stops, we'll no longer be in an emergency. What would X be? Through you, Madam President. Uh, through you, Madam President. Madam President, right now the World Health Organization, the, C the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and all other recognized uh, uh, public health uh, authorities in the United States and globally uh, recognize that uh, we are in the middle uh, of a global pandemic, a pandemic that has both severe uh, public health consequences but also ancillary uh, economic uh, benefit, uh, uh, consequences uh, as well. Um, and while I am not an epidemiologist, I don't play one on, te on TV, um, I do know that we're in an emergency right now. Uh, when uh, we're not in one, uh, I will, uh, um, it's a good question, and, and perhaps uh, you and I, uh, uh, through you, Madam President, uh, could figure out, uh, uh, perhaps in another setting, uh, what the appropriate metrics would be. Uh, I don't know, pretend to know that at this point, uh, but I know that we're in one right now. Through you. Thank you, Senator, Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. I appreciate the gentleman's personal knowledge that we are in an emergency, but I don't think that's relevant for making policy for the state of Connecticut, especially when it requires policy that sometimes asks people to give up their individual liberty. So I beg that we need to have something more concrete than the gentleman's personal knowledge. You look around the world, and there are countries, entire countries, who don't feel like we're in an emergency. They have given up all of their mandates and protocols. They do not have declared emergencies in their countries. We have the majority, the vast majority of states in the union do not have declared emergencies because apparently they know that there is no emergency. And I'm not trying to be cute here. I'm simply suggesting that anyone's allowed an opinion. And the gentleman can know personally that we're in an emergency, but that's not the same thing of being able to demonstrate why there is an emergency that requires the state to declare it in a resolution and put it into law and then make policy based on it. That's a much higher bar in my opinion. Let me use an example. During the House debate, my dear friend and colleague, Representative Gail Master of Francesco, did an amazing job of asking the same line of questioning in the House. And what she said was there needs to be parameters. There has to be something that you can hang your hat on and say, okay, we are in an emergency because X. And to me, the most logical, the most logical thing we could look at is hospitalization rates. And the reason why I say that is because if you all remember back to day one of the pandemic, the very first thing that we were asked to do was to slow the spread, 14 days to slow the spread, 14 days to flatten the curve. And why? Because we don't want to overwhelm our hospitals. I'll also point out that when the President of the United States came before the people of this country, he didn't tell them, we're going to lock you down. We're not going to shut you in your home. We're not going to do any of these things. We're going to advise you what's going on, and we're going to ask you as free citizens to help us prevent the hospitals from being overwhelmed. So that, to me, was the critical moment when we realized the emergency is determined by whether or not our system, our society, could react and adapt to what was going on. Look. If someone has a bad case of the flu, that may be an emergency to them. It might be an emergency in their household. They may die from it. It might be a tragedy. And the same thing goes for COVID. But that's not an emergency to the state of Connecticut. An emergency to the state of Connecticut would mean that there's enough people with the flu or enough people with COVID that the state can't function properly or something has to change so that we can react to it. Hospitals have not been overloaded in Connecticut, not for a long time. Back in late September, the last time we renewed this emergency, the hospitalization rate for COVID-19, and that is with COVID-19, which I don't want to get into that whole speculation, but that's different than for COVID-19, was 3.61%. Today, well, actually, this is not today. I got these numbers on Friday. I don't know what they are today. 3.61%. 
Today is, or Friday, forgive me, was 467 people hospitalized. And that is a significant number. I will grant anyone that. 467 hospitalized with anything is a significant number. Except when you compare it to the fact that there's 7,844 hospital beds, you realize that's only 5.95% of our hospital beds. And more important than that, more important, over 6,000 people are hospitalized for other things. So our hospitals actually are at 80% capacity, which is significant and important in my eyes. But out of those 6,000 plus people that are hospitalized, only 467 of them are hospitalized for COVID. And less than 6% of people in the hospital are hospitalized for COVID. The highest ever, I want to compare that to, by the way, was on April 22nd of 2020, right after this began. And at that time, there were 1,972 people hospitalized. That was 25% of the hospital capacity. Even that, I think, is a hard thing to say was an emergency to the state of Connecticut. You combine that with the unknowns, and yes, I would say, I would lean towards yes, there was an emergency. Today, there are far less unknowns. I also want to point out that we were here on July 14th to renew the governor's emergency, I think for the fifth time. And on that day, on that day, there were only 25 people hospitalized for COVID in Connecticut. 25. And that's with COVID. That number is 0.00318% of the total 7,800 hospital beds. If we are going to say that there is an emergency, then we ought to have something to say there's an emergency. And to me, the hospitalization rate is that thing. Madam President, I have an amendment. It is LCO 1067. Um, please call that amendment. Mr. Clerk. LCO number 1067. Senate Schedule A. Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. I move adoption, and I'd like to seek leave of the chamber to remark on that amendment. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam President. I just got through describing what our history has been. Would anyone think that if our hospitals had 75% capacity that that would be an emergency? I don't know. That's a tough question. Maybe that's a yes. Well, what about 50%? Maybe less so, but even still, that is a significant amount of people in the hospital. That might put, in a, dr put a drain on the resources of the state. 25%? We've been there early on. How about 10%? I wonder if anyone believes that if we got below 10% hospitalization, for COVID-19, we would still be experiencing a state of emergency in Connecticut. And because I want to answer that question, I have this amendment, which puts some clarity into the resolution before us. Because the resolution before us is nothing but an arbitrary statement. Because someone has the feels, or they believe we're an emergency, they can vote yes on the resolution as is. I would like to change this resolution so it means something, Madam President, by saying, essentially, as the amendment does, that if the hospitalization rates drop below 10% of the total hospital capacity for more than 30 days, this uh, declaration of public health and civil preparedness emergencies would uh, expire. I think it's a fair compromise. I chose 10% as a really significantly low threshold. I think a lot of reasonable people would even say 25 or 50 percent is a reasonable threshold. Less than 10 percent. That's what I'm going for, Madam President. I ask my colleagues to consider this as a reasonable way to address whether or not we are truly in a state of emergency in Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sampson. Will you remark, Senator Lesser? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam President. And Madam President, I uh, appreciate uh, 
uh, the intent of this amendment, uh, which is to bring uh, important metrics uh, into uh, the evaluation of a state of emergency. I think that is an important and worthy goal. Uh, I would just refer uh, the gentleman to the whereas is uh, in the resolution, which I think state uh, some of the uh, conditions that we see as contributing uh, to uh, the ongoing emergency. Uh, but specifically with regard to uh, the amendment, um, I, I was interested in hearing his introductory language, uh, which referenced uh, two different uh, dates uh, for hospitalization. One was before the Omicron wave uh, of the pandemic. The other was after uh, the main part of the wave. Uh, and I think it is very easy to say, hey, we don't have a hospitalization problem when you're ignoring uh, a, a giant uh, ballooning uh, of the hospitalization population. Uh, I don't think that was the gentleman's intent, uh, but I think in picking those two uh, data points, uh, I think it was, uh, would have been easy uh, to forget that we had an Omicron wave uh, at all. Uh, I do have a question, uh, maybe a, a couple of questions. Um, one is uh, that uh, I note that the, it just says on line three of the amendment uh, that uh, hospital capacity, is, is that just general hospital capacity uh, or is the gentleman uh, intending to capture uh, intensive care capacity through you, Madam President? Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. This is the inpatient bed capacity, which in Connecticut, according to the federal uh, Department of Health and Human Services is 7,844 beds. I did contemplate doing this based on ICU numbers, but honestly, um, this is uh, even more beneficial to those who would say we're in an emergency than that is. Through you, Madam President. Senator Lesser. Well, thank you, Madam President. I, I don't know whether beneficial is really the, the, the correct metric. Um, I do think accurate, though, is because, you know, when looking at uh, hospitalization uh, overall, uh, we get uh, a very different picture uh, than when you look at the much smaller uh, but much more fragile a number of intensive care beds. Uh, so is the gentleman at all concerned that you might have a case where there's a relatively low number uh, of beds being occupied, uh, but that our ICU system uh, could be completely overwhelmed? Through you. Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. I'm not. And the reason why is this. First off, that has not been the case ever. And second of all, we have not changed our laws governing public health emergencies and civil preparedness emergencies in this state under 28-9 and, um, is it 19A? I can't remember from the life of me. Um, and the governor uh, still has the power. If there was a genuine emergency that occurred tonight at 3 in the morning, tomorrow, a week from now, a year from now, he will have the power, presuming he's in office, to be able to declare an emergency and act immediately. Something that this body can't do anyway, which is what we were told over and over again why we had to extend the governor's emergencies. Senator Lesser. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Madam President, the, during the Omicron wave, I, I met with a number of local uh, hospitals, uh, including uh, my local hospital uh, in Middletown. And one of the things they uh, said that differentiated the Omicron wave from previous uh, waves of the pandemic was the percentage of the overall hospital workforce that were out sick. Uh, they were themselves getting sick. It was causing a major strain uh, on resources. And so while beds uh, were theoretically available, they did not have staffing uh, to adequately staff them. Is there anything in the amendment that contemplates a staffing uh, crunch uh, as contributing to a health care crisis or emergency under this amendment? Through you. Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, not directly, but indirectly, this amendment, if adopted, would mean that we are no longer in a state of emergency, and therefore the mandates on hospitals to require vaccinated health care workers would go away, and we would have a lot more staff in those hospitals. Through you, Madam President. Senator Lesser. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure that the mandates are, would go away or are all related because there aren't any uh, mandates that are uh, contemplated uh, by this resolution. It's simply a recognition uh, of... Uh, an existing emergency. There's no uh, specific uh, 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 anything uh, tied to this other than uh, a recognition that we are in a state of emergency. So perhaps uh, the, the gentleman could refer me uh, to any mandates that he sees uh, in the resolution in case I miss them. But, but just sort of going on uh, to the sort of practical uh, import of this uh, proposed amendment, you know, it occurs to me that, uh, you know, he mentioned a point a year ago when we had uh, a lull uh, in waves and we saw that uh, the numbers then uh, increased uh, during the Delta and Omicron waves. Um, and also note that the 
number of hospitalization is sort of by definition a lagging indicator. You know, we might see uh, the Omicron wave coming, uh, but the hospitalizations might not start creeping up uh, until uh, well into it because of the uh, way that the disease uh, uh, takes hold. Uh, is there anything in this uh, resolution that would, or in your amendment to the resolution, uh, that would protect us uh, from a subsequent wave, uh, knowing uh, that you're going to be waiting until uh, hospitalizations hit 10%, uh, which might be uh, quite a while. Uh, is there anything that would account for potential future waves through you? Senator Sampson. I appreciate the gentleman's question, but let me reiterate that there are 7,844 hospital beds, and there has never been more than 25% of those hospital beds occupied by COVID patients, not since the beginning of the pandemic, since before there was a vaccine, since the, before there was any cure, before there was a uh, protocols for lockdowns, masking, or any other social distancing, you name it. None of those things existed that exist today, and we never exceeded 25%. And we have not been over 10% in a long, long time. And as I suggested a moment ago, we are actually at a higher number than we have been for months right now. Um, and that number is still 467. Um, we cannot forget that there are 6,358 other people in the hospital for other things to try and equate the fact that a small fraction of those people are in the hospital with COVID, with an emergency, is a stretch of anyone's imagination. These are facts on paper. And through you, Madam President, my response really is that I would offer the gentleman any type of collaborative effort to come up with some other amendment before this day is over that actually puts pen to paper and says, this is a metric that we can agree with that determines whether or not the state of Connecticut is in a state of emergency. Because the point of this amendment is for me to actually point out that there isn't one, that the underlying resolution is nothing. It is an arbitrary decision made by people who feel or believe that there's an emergency without any facts or documentation whatsoever. No, I appreciate that, and I, and I appreciate the gentleman's offer, uh, and I, I certainly uh, take him up on his desire to, to, to identify uh, consensus metrics to determine the severity of the pandemic. I think that is an important and worthy goal, uh, and one that shouldn't uh, be uh, a partisan issue, but something that unites all Americans and, in fact, all people uh, across the world. Uh, I would just say that I take serious issue with this metric, uh, because I think, in listening to his explanation, uh, the gentleman seems to su suggest uh, that because we have not ever exceeded, uh, according to his numbers, and I, I take them at face value, I've not looked them up myself, 25% um, of hospital beds are for COVID, that somehow that does not, uh, that's not that big of a deal uh, for Connecticut's hospitals. Uh, and, you know, when I go out and I talk to healthcare workers, people who've been on the front line of the pandemic, I, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, that not only uh, has this been uh, this pandemic been and continues to be uh, a huge deal uh, for Connecticut's frontline healthcare workers, uh, many of whom have gotten sick, many of them who, who many of whom have died, uh, but it continues to present a major challenge uh, to our state's hospital infrastructure. And there's a specific problem uh, with the amendment before us which is that it misses one of the critical metrics, which is our ICU capacity. There were uh, plenty of times, uh, particularly in the first wave of the pandemic, where our ICU capacity was beleaguered uh, to the breaking point, uh, where we had uh, the National Guard uh, operating in support uh, of our continued hospital functions, where people were delaying needed care, where there was a huge impact on people's ability to stay healthy, to stay uh, and to get the care that they needed. Uh, and to say otherwise, I think, really is a disservice to the nurses, the doctors, and all of the hospital staff uh, who've been pu putting themselves in, in, in harm's way. And obviously, uh, there are an awful lot of healthcare workers who work in non-hospital settings uh, as well who should also be acknowledged. But uh, I just think that this is, uh, you know, while the attempt to grab uh, a, a metric is, is important, I, I think this misses the larger point, uh, which is that there's an emergency, and it's an emergency that has particularly beleaguered our frontline healthcare workers. Uh, so th with that, Madam President, I urge a rejection of the amendment, and I ask that when the vote be taken, it be taken by roll. Thank you, Senator Lesser. When we take uh, a vote on the amendment, it will be taken by roll. Uh, Senator Sampson.
Thank you, Madam President. I just simply need to correct the gentleman in some of his commentary. Uh, nowhere did I say that it's no big deal that hospitalization rate was only 25% at its maximum. I, I did not say that. I said that some people would say that that is not enough to warrant an emergency. And I also want to clarify that I was very, very specific about suggesting that there can be emergencies affecting individuals, there can be emergencies affecting hospitals or ICUs or any type of uh, parameter out there you want to mention. But this debate is about whether there is an emergency for the state of Connecticut. The state of Connecticut is not in an emergency because one ICU is in an emergency. I also want to remind everyone listening that this entire debate over this amendment is tied to a resolution that admittedly has no bearing on anything other than the receipt of some federal funds, since it will not empower the state to do anything that it wouldn't otherwise be able to do. This amendment is a good amendment, Madam President, it is an amendment that basically says we are going to have a line in the sand about when there is an emergency and when there's not, so the people of the state of Connecticut can feel confident that when we tell them there's a state of emergency, we're not making it up. That they can actually say, yes, there is something to cling to. And as I said, if this is not an acceptable parameter, let's come up with one. We do have time. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Williams. All the senators voted. Have all the senators voted? The machine will be locked. Mr. Clerk, please announce the tally. On Senate Amendment A, LCO number 1067, total number voting 35, total number voting yay 13, total voting nay 22, absent not voting 1. And the amendment fails. Thank you, Madam President. Yeah, so of course I'm disappointed that the amendment failed, but I would like to uh, make that offer again, that if uh, anyone in the room um, is open to declaring some sort of parameters we could all agree with, uh, I think that would improve this resolution dramatically. Uh, because I feel uh, that we are no longer in a state of emergency as the state of Connecticut. I'll repeat again that that has nothing to do with whether the pandemic carries on. I'm concerned that we may have to live with COVID-19 uh, indefinitely, uh, and our society is going to have to learn how to cope with that. But we cannot stay in a state of emergency forever because COVID is going to be around. We have to find a way to operate and function despite its existence. During the uh, House debate, the House Republicans did a great job of making comparisons to other things that are impacting the health of our citizens. Uh, they said thousands of people die in our state every year, and some things are even more prevalent than COVID-19. They pointed out that more people uh, by far actually die of heart disease and cancer, but we have not declared emergencies for those items. The issue that we are debating is not whether COVID-19 is real or if it's over. I would never say that. The question is very simply, is the state of Connecticut experiencing a state of emergency right now? And if the answer is no, and I believe it is no, Madam President, it would be simply dishonest to pass this legislation. When most people think of a disaster or an emergency that the state has to declare a state of emergency for, what comes to mind? They cut you up a Category 5 hurricane, a giant meteor. It's Middletown <laughs> or any other place. That would be an emergency. Everyone would get around to that. Everyone would agree. There would be no partisan vote either. This is different. When we debated the last two extensions, there was no emergency in the state then. I made that very clear at the time. I think I made an unequivocal case that there was no emergency and in fact, today, since then, no one has ever come up to me and said, any of your facts were wrong, anything I said was inaccurate. And that's because I used the administration's own data. As I said, July 14th, which was 
the fifth extension, 30 people hospitalized. September 28th, there were 259 people hospitalized. As of Friday, again, 467. But that number is trending down rapidly. And comparing that to our capacity to manage our healthcare system, we have not been in a state of emergency for a long, long time. And I would submit, Madam President, the real reason why some of these restrictions are being eased has nothing to do with the state of COVID-19. It has to do with the state of political opinion, or public opinion, rather. Again, not diminishing the reality of the pandemic, but people are realizing more and more every day that a lot of the hysteria is being created by the government constantly saying we're in an emergency and the media reporting it as such. It's also the reason why I voted against every one of the extensions up until now, because I was never satisfied that the state could not operate um, based on what was going on with COVID-19. To say the state of the state of Connecticut was so significant and affecting our government and society so much that we could not operate or that we were experiencing major interruptions because of the virus is false. Now, don't, don't let me walk away from that statement without making it clear. Our society has indeed faced major upheaval and interruptions. And I know that the good gentleman mentioned um, supply chain interruptions. But I want to point out that none of those things were a result of COVID-19. Those things were a result of the government's reaction to COVID-19. Much of it unnecessary. And one great example is that the average person on the street seems to think that for the last two years, none of the people that are sitting in this chamber have done anything. Everywhere I go, people keep accusing me of, you need to go back to work, Senator. How dare you? Collecting a paycheck. That's because they believe that this body hasn't been meeting and passing laws. And you bet we have. I don't know the exact number of laws we passed in the last session, but it was a lot. Is that an example that our system is breaking down and the state can't function and that we need to clear an emergency? Of course not. We adapted, maybe we had some Zoom hearings, things like that, but we functioned. There was no emergency. So, Madam President, I have to tell you something. This past weekend, I went to a Super Bowl party yesterday, for instance, and I'm talking to a lot of people who came up to me, you know, knowing what I do. And some of them watched the House debate last Thursday. And many of these people have never watched any um, legislative hearing or debate or vote on anything before. It was a first experience for many of them. And it's because a lot of these folks are people that are just getting involved. Maybe it's some moms concerned about the mask issue um, or any, any other thing. I, I don't know exactly what they were all involved with, but I am very aware that more and more people are paying attention to what we are doing in our state government than ever, and I love that. Anyway, they came up to me, and I remember this one woman telling me that she was, quote, unquote, appalled. And I have to tell you, it's really hard for me to describe the shock and amazement that these people described to me, talking to me about what they witnessed watching the House debate. They just could not believe that debate. And partly because I think it became extremely clear that the sole purpose of this resolution during the debate of the House, it became obvious to anyone watching is that the only real reason this was there was to convince the federal government that we are eligible for additional funds in the form of enhanced SNAP benefits. One of our House colleagues, Representative Doug Dubitsky, described it on the floor of the House as lying to the federal government for money. Another representative asked, how is this different from faking an injury to defraud workers' compensation? Wow, what a great point. And I would say it's pretty damning stuff because as much as I tried to find some other element or benefit that the state gets from this 
declaration of these emergencies, it's obvious to me that the only concrete thing that is achieved is we're getting federal money. And we're getting federal money based on our assertion there's an emergency without any um, thing to point to to say that there's an emergency other than we feel or we believe it. It's pretty damning stuff, if you ask me. And those people thought it was pretty damning stuff. They were shocked at their government. And the fact that the House voted on a party line also, it should say a lot. As I mentioned, if we were really experiencing an emergency, giant meteor or a Cat 5 hurricane, as I mentioned, we wouldn't have not have a partisan vote. It just wouldn't happen. I think we could all, we might not agree on a whole lot, but we would certainly agree that if a giant meteor hit the state and there were people dying from that, that it would be an emergency. Let me say this, just wrapping up. If the governor of the state of Connecticut wants to declare another emergency and continue stretching the truth about whether we're in a state of emergency to get federal money or to exercise his you know, expanded authority, then, then let him. You know, the statute, I, as, as much as I hate the statute that he operated under, um, it says that he can arbitrarily determine when there's an emergency. But not this body. This body should not be passing what I would consider to be a shady resolution for the purpose of defrauding the federal government to grab tax dollars that we don't even need. I keep hearing that this state is awash with money. We're going to have a surplus, which is a whole other conversation. It blows my mind, Madam President. I have watched this state government pass budget after budget that were so irresponsible that should put us in a multi-billion dollar hole, but thank heavens we benefit from mountains of federal cash coming our way that is going to dig us out of that hole. But that's another debate. The fact remains, though, we don't need to do this. There's plenty of money. I contemplated earlier, listening to Senator Anwar, that we should just offer an amendment to appropriate the $32 million a month for SNAP benefits. I would support that. We have the funds to do that, thanks to the federal government. We do not need to tell the federal government that we have an emergency we don't have to get them to give us that money. I'm calling on my fellow senators in both parties today to think hard about what kind of message we are sending to our constituents. Is the state of Connecticut in turmoil? Can the state government operate? Can the legislature meet? Can the executive branch do their job? Can the people in the various agencies do what they're supposed to? Or are they in a state of emergency? Be honest with yourself. Not to mention the fact that by telling the people of the state of Connecticut that we are still in an emergency, you're scaring people. You are scaring people. There are people who live in my district who have not left their house since the beginning of COVID. People that had no reason to either. They're not particularly at risk. Voting in favor of this resolution is clearly wrong. Anyone watching this debate can see that, just like those ladies that I was talking to last night. We are misinforming the public if we pass this. And that is the opposite of our responsibility here. We should be informing our constituents of the truth about where we stand. Those statistics that I just shared about the hospitalizations and so forth, do you know that the average person doesn't know any of that information? That would be a proper obligation to make sure that people truly know what the extent of COVID is so they can make their own choices. We should be giving them the truth and empowering them to make their best choices for their health and safety. The state government needs to stop ruling the people of this state and begin listening, informing, and empowering. Let's be better than this, Madam President. Machine will be locked. Mr. Clerk, please announce the tally. House Joint Resolution number one. Total number voting 34, total voting yay 21, total voting nay 13, absent not voting two. The resolution is adopted, Senator Looney.